الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد اشد واهتدى ومن يعصهما فانه قد غوى وانه لا يضر الا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا ان خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان خير الامور عوازمها وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد ان شاء الله today i will be beginning with the story of a particular sahabi a companion of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam This particular Sahabi was one of the very early Muslims who accepted Islam in Mecca. So he was a Sahabi who migrated with the Muslims. He made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. He fought for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Battle of Badr, the first major battle that the Muslims fought. But he's not one of the names we always hear like Abu Bakr or Umar or Hamza radiyallahu anhu. This Sahabi was Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiyallahu anhu. As Ibn Kathir describes, Hatib radiyallahu anhu, he was living in Mecca. He had children, he had wealth. So from that materialistic standpoint, he was living comfortably. He was a successful man in that society. However, what stood out about Hatib ibn Abi Balta in particular in comparison to the many others in Mecca was that he was not a part of the tribe of Quraysh. He was not from the Quraysh. And when we put that information into the context of the tribal societies of pre-Islamic Mecca we can recognize that that puts him in a stressful situation at times these were societies as we know that extremely valued their lineages their tribal connections if you were from a certain family that automatically made you a more important person if you were from a more powerful or a more influential clan that determined how the society interacted with you if you were from a weak clan that also determined how the society interacted with you Hatta radiyallahu anhu did not have this but as we mentioned he was one of the early muslims i mentioned that he made the hijra to medina he participated in the battle of badr so the part of his life that we're going to focus on though is in the context after the hijra when the quraysh of mecca violated the treaty of hudaybiyah that they had with the muslims so this was a treaty between the quraysh of mecca with the muslim state in medina So when that treaty of Hudaybiyah was broken by the Quraysh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the leader of the Muslims, he made the decision that it was time to conquer Mecca. He made the decision to open Mecca under the leadership and authority of Islam. He began gathering and mobilizing the Sahaba, the Muhajireen, the Ansar, the forces of the Muslims at large. And at this time, while he's gathering the Muslims, preparing them to head towards Mecca, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Allahumma ammi alayhim khabarana. He said, oh Allah, keep our news concealed from them. Make it so that they're not aware that we are heading towards Mecca. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is making this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the part of the story where Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiallahu anhu, he enters now. He was of course, as we mentioned, he was one of the Muslims. He was there in Medina. So he was aware of these plans. that the Muslims were going to take their army and head towards Mecca. But Hatib radiallahu anhu, remember, he didn't have those tribal connections that the other Muhajirin had, the others who migrated from Mecca to Medina. So he became concerned of the Muslims heading for an attack on Mecca. But his family who was still there did not have any connections, any people who would protect them. So he became very concerned in this situation for his own family who was in Mecca. So what was his decision in this situation Hatib radiyallahu anhu he wrote a letter to the Quraysh it's one of the muslims in Medina he wrote a letter to the Quraysh to the kuffar to the enemies of Islam the ones who just 
violated the treaty with the Muslims. And he wrote this letter to actually inform them of the Muslims' plans to head towards Mecca. He gave this letter, after he wrote it, he gave it to a woman of the Quraysh who was in Medina, and he sent her to go deliver this, this letter to the Quraysh. Now remember, Rasulullah wasallam, he had already made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking for this news to be hidden. He mentioned, Allahumma ammi alayhim khabarna. Oh Allah, keep our news concealed from them. So even with that letter being sent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still answered this dua. He informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of what was transpiring. He informed him that this letter was sent. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gathered three of the Sahaba, Ali, Zubair, al maqdad and he, he informed them of where they would be able to find this woman who has this letter. So they went, they started traveling, they caught up with her, and they retrieved this letter from her. They retrieved it from her, they brought it back to Medina to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was written on that letter that they found, it was exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of. That Hatib was informing the Quraysh of the Muslims' plans to conquer Mecca. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked him, he said, Ya Hatib, ma hadha? O Hatib, what is this? And Hatib responded to his question, he said, Ya Rasulullah, o, o Messenger of Allah, do not make a hasty decision about me. I was a person not belonging to the Quraysh, but I was an ally to them. All the emigrants, the muhajirin, who were with you have kinsmen in Mecca who can protect their families. So I wanted to do them a favor so they might protect my relatives, as I have no blood relation with them. I did not do this out of disbelief or to renegade from my religion, nor did I do it to choose disbelief after Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after how to mention this, he said to the other sahaba present, Innahu sadaqakum. That regarding Hatib, he has told you the truth. When Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu heard this, and we know Umar was a very strong, straightforward person. He had a very unwavering personality. His response to Rasulullah wasallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to chop off the head of this munafiq, of this hypocrite. He's calling this person a munafiq, that he sent a letter to the kuffar to tell them where we are going. Allow me to chop off his head, allow me to kill him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he responded to this as well. He said to Umar, he attended Badr, regarding Hatib. He said, he attended Badr. What can I tell you? Perhaps Allah looked at those who attended Badr, and he said, oh the people of Badr, do what you like, for I have forgiven you. And Umar radiallahu anhu, with the tears streaming down his face at this point, he responded, he said, Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alone have the knowledge of reality. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prevented Umar radiallahu anhu from killing Hatib ibn Abi Batla. But he recognized that Hatib made a grave mistake. Everyone in this picture recognized Hatib made a mistake. No one was defending him. The Sahaba recognized it. Umar radiallahu anhu very clearly recognized it with his reaction. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized it. Otherwise, he would not have said that perhaps Allah has forgiven him. In order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive someone, they have to have done something wrong first, something sinful, something that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam identifies the actions of Hatib as such, as something displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that perhaps Allah will forgive him. Now this incident involving Hatib ibn Abi Batla, it became the background for the revelation of Surah Al-Mumtahina where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا عدوي وعدوكم أولياء O you who have believed do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies تلقون إليهم بالمودة وقد كفروا بما جاءكم من الحق يخرجون رسول وإياكم أن تؤمنوا بالله ربكم Extending to them affection, while they have disbelieved in what came to you of the truth, having driven out the Prophet and yourselves, only because you believe in Allah your Lord. In kuntum kharjtum jihadan fi sabili wa tira If you have come out for jihad in my cause and seeking means to my approval, then take them not as your friends. Tusaruna ilayhim bil mawaddati wa ana a'lamu bima akhfaytum wa ma a'lamatum wa man yaf'alhu minkum faqad adalla sawa as-sabeel You confide to them affection 
But I am most knowing of what you have concealed and what you have declared. And whoever does it among you has certainly strayed from the soundness of way, meaning the straight, they have strayed from the straight path. So the Sahaba, they recognized Hatib who has done something wrong. If the brothers could please move forward, there's still brothers standing in the back. Jazakallah khair. The Sahaba at large recognized something was done wrong. Umar radiallahu anhu definitely recognized it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indicated something wrong was done. And now in this one ayah that I just read, the first ayah of Surah Al-Muntahina, even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sternly categorized what Hatib ibn Abi Batla'a had done as a sinful action. As something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not approve of. This action of taking the enemies of Islam and the enemies of Allah as allies, seeking support from them, extending any slightest affection towards them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned at the end of the ayah, وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْهُ مِنْكُمْ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ And whoever does it among you has strayed from the straight path. So now the question is, why am I bringing up this story right now? Why am I bringing up this ayah, this surah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the context of the story? Alhamdulillah, some of you know this is probably my last khutbah here as a UIC student. So I was thinking back to what are some lessons that I have learned during my time at UIC that I could share before I head out now, right? And I'm thinking there's so many things that I've learned over the last few years. There's too many things to list all in one khutbah. But to just think about one or two, the most important lessons that I learned being here at UIC, it's not from you know, electrical engineering, data science, math, whatever classes I took, those aren't the most, lesson, most important lessons I learned. The most important lessons learned from having such a large and such a, you know, mashallah, active Muslim community around me here. And one of my main takeaways was the importance of being a voice of Islam. The importance of being an ambassador of Islam. The importance of being someone who carries the da'wah of Islam completely and comprehensively and carries that to the rest of the world. To be someone who, regardless of whatever hardships are faced, we hold firm to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we, re- we remain united in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He commands us in Surah Ali Imran. This responsibility is on us as Muslims. The obligation to carry Islam, the obligation to propagate Islam, the obligation to defend Islam and the Muslims. It's on our shoulders. It's on the shoulders of every single individual, man or woman, who holds La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah in our hearts. And it's not an individual responsibility for us. One of the disgusting ills of the society that we live in today, that has been strategically forced upon the Muslims and the Muslim minds, has been leading us to fall for the secular liberal idea and values of individualism. We as Muslims, we stand together as an ummah. And we understand that there is work and there are obligations that are to be done collectively as an ummah. They are not to be done alone and actually cannot be done alone. The prime example of this should already be on our minds, which is our brothers and sisters in Gaza and Palestine, which I've spoken about on this minbar countless times because it's such a pressing issue of our times that needs to be spoken about and it would be shameful for me to ignore it. Because as I mentioned already, it's our responsibility to speak on it. So when we engage in our activism that has been prescribed for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do so as a collective, as an ummah. Because it is work that cannot take, it cannot take us to our end goal if we work on it alone. The end goal being the removal of the occupation of Palestine. Now when we're looking at our present day reality, we can draw from the story of Hatib ibn Abi Batla'a from just the first ayah of Surah Al-Muntahina that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in that context. Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu la tattakhidu aduwi wa aduwakum awliya tulquna ilayhim bil mawaddati wa qad kafaru bima ja'akum min al-haqqi yukhrijuna rasula wa iyyakum an tu'minu billahi rabbikum in kuntum in kuntum kharajtum jihadan fi sabili wa tira'a mardati tusiru ilayhim bil mawaddati wa ana a'lamu bima akhfaytum wa ma a'lantum وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْهُ مِنْكُمْ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ That all you who have believed do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies, extending to them affection while they have disbelieved in what came to you of the truth. Having driven out the Prophet and yourselves because you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your Lord, 
If you have come out for jihad in my cause and seeking means to my approval, take them not as your friends. You confide to them affection, but I am most knowing of what you have concealed and what you have declared. And whoever does it among you has certainly strayed from the straight path. Ibn Kathir in his tafsir of this ayah, he mentions that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, do not take my enemies and your enemies as allies, he subhanahu wa ta'ala, quote, he refers to the idolaters and the disbelievers who are combatants against Allah and his messenger and the believers. It is they whom Allah has decided should be our enemies and should be fought. Allah has forbidden the believers to take them as friends, supporters, or companions, end quote. Today in Gaza, the enemies, the enemies of Islam are clear. Those who are combatants against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger, the believers, it's very, very clear. It's the illegal Zionist entity. It's America who provides them the backbone to their oppressive operations. And they've made it clear through several means that they hate when the Muslims remember Islam. And they hate when the people, Muslims or non-Muslims, speak up against the injustices in Gaza. They censor our social media, they delete our posts, they ban our accounts. In the past week, we've seen the inhumane brutality and force they're willing to use against students our ages across various universities, courageously standing up for Palestine. So these are not the people that we as Muslims are allowed to seek support from. Our support cannot be from those whose hands are filthy with the blood of the young sons and daughters of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Gaza. Change and achieving the end goal that we seek. The removal of the occupation of Palestine and the liberation of Palestine will not be at the hands of America. It will not be at the hands of the congressmen and the senators and the representatives. Change will come at the hands of the Ummah bi'idhnillah when we work towards it. Just as, the, just as the Sahaba were able to strive for a better society prior to the Hijrah to Medina, we have to do the same. Many of the Sahaba were our ages when they did it. Societal change in accordance with Islam came at the hands of the youth. It was the conviction of al arqa bin Abi al arqa who had the bravery to house the early Muslims in his home. It was the bravery, bravery of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu who accepted Islam at such a young age when his own father would not do it. It was the knowledge and understanding of Mus'a bin Umair radiallahu anhu to be the first ambassador of Islam and carry the da'wah of Islam to the leaders of Yathir. The people of conviction were the ones who were successful in completely uprooting and changing the norms of their society. It was Sumayya bin Khayyad, her willingness to be the first to give her life for this deen. It was Jafar bin Abi Talib and his confidence to recite Surah Maryam in front of Al-Najashi in, uh, in Habasha. It was Abdullah bin Mas'ud longing for Jannah when he would recite the verses of Surah Al-Rahman publicly in front of the Quraysh because he knew they hated to hear it. When we remember these strong examples, in the current context, we often ask, where are these strong personalities today? Where are these people in our ummah today? Where are the people of strength? Where are the people of conviction? But I don't believe that these questions that are often asked are the correct questions to be asking. Because the answer to these questions, of where are the strong Muslims? Where are the Muslims of conviction? The answer to these questions is sitting right in front of me right now. The Muslims of strength and the people of conviction are sitting in front of me right now in this room. The Muslims who are capable of saving Masjid al-Aqsa from the hands of the oppressors are sitting in front of me right now. And throughout today, Yom al-Jum'ah, they're sitting in masajid and universities listening to the khutbahs across the world today. And brothers, if you could please continue to move up. Jazakumullah khairan. If the Ummah was not capable of such tall tasks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have given these to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have tested us with them. And we have conviction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put every single one of us on this earth at a time and a place when we are capable of the test that we will be presented with. But then it's on us. Once He's given us these tests and He's put us where we're supposed to be, it is on us to put in that work to be the people of change. It's on us to be the voice of Islam, to be the ones who stand firm on the deen with conviction, regardless of what may stand in our way. We must stand united as an ummah, rejecting notions of individualism, to fulfill our inherent obligations towards the ummah and towards humanity at large. 
to bring them from the many darknesses of this world to the one true light of Islam. And we do so from within ourselves because we are capable and because there's an obligation to do it in this way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in Surah An-Nisa, Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu, la tattakhidu al-kafirina awliya min dun al-muslimin, min dun al-mu'mineen. Atu'iduna an taj'alu lillahi alaykum sultan al-mubina. O you who have believed, do not take the disbelievers as allies instead of the believers, in place of the believers. Do you wish to give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a proof against yourself? So when we engage in our capacity, as Muslims, in doing so, we call upon those, the sincere, within our ummah. We call upon the sincere within our ummah who have the means to initiate that greater change and who understand that they will be accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we continue to use our voices and our platforms, wherever we may be, and regardless of what stands in our way, with the aqidah of Islam as our constant basis, and we remain patient on this path, regardless of the push to abandon the method that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained for us. Remember, brothers and sisters, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold this time when he mentioned that there shall come upon the people a time in which the one who is patient upon his deen will be like the one holding on to a burning ember. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are patient upon their deen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those at whose hands Masjid al-Aqsa witnesses its liberation. Qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullaha li wa lakum wa li sa'iril muslimin fa astaghfiruh innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين أما بعد فيا معشر المسلمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد بعدد من صلى وصام اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد بعدد من قعد وقام اللهم اللهم صل على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى سائر الصحابة والتابعين وعلى عبادك الصالحين اللهم أيد الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أيد الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أنصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم واجعلنا منهم واخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا منهم اللهم أين الحق حقا وزقنا اتباعه وأين الباطل باطلا وزقنا اجتنابه اللهم ثبتنا على الإسلام اللهم نور قلوبنا بنور الإيمان اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم وذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأولى وأعز وأجل وأتم وأهم وأكبر وأقيم الصلاة